I think exercise is about habit. Uh, exercise can be fun, it should be fun ideally and not just the slog, though at the beginning of a training program it can be an awful slog. But if you make it into, you know, you get back in the door when you come home in the evening and you pull on your running shoes, your walking shoes, your, you, 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 your uh, get on your bicycle or whatever, and, and do that most days just as a habit. And with foods that are tempting, fast foods that are easier, and it's all true, if you have them in your house, you're going to eat them. And uh, you have to kind of think about your patterns of behavior, so how to move away from things you perhaps shouldn't be eating. Um, so my, my talk sort of starts out and wanders all over the place. Uh, I know we were supposed to talk about you know, holiday difficulties with diet and exercise, living patterns, so I guess um, perhaps all I can say there, the rest of my talk does reflect on these issues, but uh, particularly over this Christmas period, taking, uh, making a walk as a family, as a sort of a routine Christmas day, Boxing Day kind of thing would be an excellent thing, it's very sociable as well. And maybe portion sizes, they're all very tempting, all these foods, they're a little bit rich uh, and um, perhaps watching portions would be a way to, to sort of alleviate that. Um, so the main thread of my story goes around starting way back uh, around the hunter-gatherer uh, era, which goes back hundreds of thousands of years. And I guess my story is particularly relevant to me because when I was in that difficult to pronounce country, Namibia, <laughs> that uh, is just about South Africa on the western side of Africa and it used to be a German colony. Um, there were the Bushmen there who were one of the original, well, multiple hunter-gathering societies around the world. And uh, I had the uh, opportunity to look after them as a doctor and um, they were wonderful people. Uh, they had a very coherent family structure, extended family structure. They were very sort of pleasant, easygoing people, very phlegmatic, tough as heck. And they would, you know, they were living in the desert, the Kalahari Desert. So they had to follow, just as this, all these stories now about hunter-gatherers and how they live, they were living that life, which is pursuing game that they shot with a poison-tipped arrow for three days, running from 10, 15 miles a day, getting water out of difficult circumstances from deep riverbeds underneath the sand, storing water in gourds, uh, picking berries, uh, eating, and they were, they were basically slim people, except they quite often would, would have a, a bit of a stomach, and that was part of this thrifty gene concept, so that when times were tough, they could feed off their bit of, bit of a padding around the, the middle. We don't need that nowadays because we have so much food that's available, it's so cheap and it's so available, which is our problem. We have too, too much, which is where I'm, I'm going. So, the Bushman was an example then of the hunter gatherers who would be on the move, their bodies would be adapted to this constant exercise and, and running away from you know, dangerous game, snakes, whatever, running off the game. So their, their whole body was tuned in to using up glucose, to burning it off, to having extreme insulin sensitivity for glucose so that they wouldn't have the problems that we have nowadays. So, but on the other hand, these Bushmen that I worked with, they were struggling to adapt to modern society because they had this, they, you know, they were living in the desert, but they filtered out of there, they were pushed out of there as well by, for political reasons. And they came into my sphere of activity where I was working, and they would struggle with food, the modern foods, and, and this, they could not live their normal hunter-gatherer kind of lifestyle. So it was really quite sad in some ways, but very instructive to see how they struggled to adapt. Um, so then after the hunter-gatherer period, leading up to 10,000 years ago, where was the, uh, then there was the agricultural revolution, if you like, the agricultural period, where people stopped, particularly in the eastern Mediterranean and South Asia, but other parts of the world as well, they stopped and they grew crops and they managed to build up reserves of food for the first time and to store it and to work in cohesive societies. And that was the beginning of cereals and, and 
sort of planted crops, organized agriculture. Then 50 to 100 years ago, the foods became more, the whole process became more industrialized. There was more processed foods, um, there were big farms, um, the, uh, as I say, more refined processed foods, which has been our downfall of, of, of recent times. And expert scientists came into the picture where they would play around with taste, smell, aroma, texture of foods. There was huge amounts of money put into the saleability of different kinds of foods. Um, how much a chip would crackle in your mouth and how long that would last for and then it would become softened by your saliva. This was all worked out in amazing detail by food scientists. So we have been, if you like, a sort of on the wrong end of an experiment of, of getting us to eat foods which really often are not good for us, as opposed to what we've heard already about from the two previous speakers um, and indeed from Norm Letniak about vegetables and um, vegetables and fruits. So um, as, as I'm going back to my story here, as the activity levels dropped, as people moved into the industrial and modern era, they moved off the farm into offices, more sedentary times, um, more, I mean, there are very great uses for handheld devices, but we can overuse them, of course, computers, movies, uh, and we can get into this modern lifestyle where we're very sedentary, which is, is, is actually killing us. Um, so it's an insidious process, and we, as I said, become sedentary, we become obese, we develop diabetes, vascular disease, cancers. And, and interestingly, British Columbia is actually the healthiest province in the whole of Canada, and uh, it's just in insightful to look into that, because we're, we have less obesity than anywhere else, we have less smoking, we have, and as a result of that, we're also more active. We have less diabetes and cardiovascular disease and cancers. It's really quite interesting, quite striking. Um, so, just to throw out a, a little fact here, the Americans in the last 20 years have become 20% more obese and actually eat 20% more calories than they used to eat 20 years ago. Um, so it's not just what we're eating, it's how much we're eating. Um, so, and just another couple of facts. A can of pop, as you may know, has 11 teaspoons of sugar in it. Um, and a teaspoon of salt is really all the salt we're allowed to have each day. That is a slightly controversial topic, salt, but I'm just throwing it out. But uh, the, it's very easy to get beyond these, these um, measurements. Also, it's useful to know that sugar is a dangerous kind of food in, in anything more than small portions. But potatoes, rice, and bread, we're discovering by going by glycemic index and glycemic load, are actually almost like eating sugar. So potato, potatoes can be, can be eaten in moderation, and rice can be eaten in moderation, but they, are, they get absorbed almost like sugar into our systems. Um, so the high glycemic index, if you really want to look at carbohydrates, because they're quite controversial. People have high carb diets, low carb diets, and vegans tend to eat obviously no, no meat or dairy, but, and they have quite a lot of grains to fill in the gaps. And those grains have to be fairly low glycemic index to make it work, otherwise we can put on weight very easily. Um, the other thing that is of so that's the glycemic index or glycemic load and all foods can be analyzed according to the ability of the food to put sugar into our bloodstream. And, and that's why I say bagels are very high glycemic index, the, the sugar just rushes into our system. And white bread and even actually brown bread, my, my recent uh, research into brown bread, whole wheat bread is actually quite interesting because it has a worse glycemic load than white bread. Now, why is that? Well, it's got these kernels in them K-E-R-N kernels that are very rich in starch and as you actually eat these, uh, these kernels of, of, you know, of wheat can actually produce high sugars in your bloodstream for several hours afterwards. So they actually contain more calories than an ordinary white, white bread. Who knew? I didn't. Um, and 
I guess my little story of my own, my own story, but like Norm shared his very interesting story with us, was that I was also getting a little plump around the middle of about a year or two ago. And I was eating, I was very active, and I was sort of running and training and doing this and that, and I'd come, come to 10 o'clock at night and I'd get really hungry, and I'd eat about four or five or even six pieces of bread, or whole wheat bread, pretty dense stuff. And, and then I started reading books like Wheat Belly and Grain Brain and these sort of things. And I realized that was it. And, uh, and it was an, almost an addictive kind of thing that I was getting into. I stopped that and dropped several pounds and off I went again. But it's, you know, these foods can be obviously comfort foods, but they can be mildly addictive as well. Sugar, obviously, it certainly can be. The other thing I could mention is inflammation. That's the, the new kind of commentary about, say, vascular disease, heart disease. It's about high cholesterol in the blood up to a point. Probably half of heart attacks come from <clears throat> high blood cholesterol. But the other half are related to particularly inflammation inside the arteries, which are our lifestyle and our diet, which is high in fat and high in sugar.